progress. It is our hope that upon the conclusion of this panel discussion, you'll have answers to and feel compelled to further ponder these questions. I too am here to learn. Our panel of esteemed local experts have agreed to take us on a journey today with understanding the roots of racism. But first, I'm thrilled to introduce you to Akila Webster, Director of Fundraising Research and Operations at United Way of Central Indiana. Akila has been with us for seven years. She and her team are responsible for analytics, data management, and process improvement for our fundraising and engagement initiatives. Akila, I know this topic has particular significance to you, and I want to thank you for agreeing to moderate our discussion today. Take it away. Thank you, Anne. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us. As Anne said, education and awareness of racial inequity and justice is a top priority here at United Way. Um, and solutions to it are critical to the success of our work to alleviate poverty. During our first Understanding the Roots of Racism event, we dug deep into racial disparities and inequities in healthcare. Tonight, our journey takes us into the topic of housing and how decades of discriminatory practices and policies have shaped housing instability for Black community members and neighborhoods. I personally am a lifelong resident of Indianapolis, born and raised here, and my family has lived in Indy for the past five generations. I have seen redlining and gentrification, two terms we will dig into later tonight, affect my own family. In the 1960s, my family rented a home near 36th and Central while my great grandmother was working and saving to buy a home of her own. Her job at the time was cleaning other people's homes, so it was while seeing those nice homes that she cleaned that she was inspired to buy a home of her own. The white woman they were renting from at that time soon sold the home that they were living in to a developer, and that developer decided to tear the house down and build a nursing home in its place. That displaced our family. My great grandmother took this as an opportunity to try to buy a home of her own, However, that opportunity was not as accessible for her as for her white counterparts. Um, redlining was a real barrier at that time and still is today. Um, her applications were denied and she was eventually forced to continue renting. And consequently, she, my grandmother, her children and her children's children all grew up in an environment where renting was the norm. So we've only had one homeowner in our immediate family since then. Can you imagine five generations and only one homeowner in the family? It's our reality. The COVID-19 crisis has amplified this burden for many people. Um, in July, a US Census Bureau survey revealed that 24% of adults in Indiana reported that they had missed their previous housing payment or had little confidence that they would make their next one on time. Imagine not knowing if you will have a roof over your head a month from now. Indiana's eviction moratorium ended on August 14th, and according to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, more than 250,000 low income Hoosier renters affected by COVID-19 will need rent relief before September 2020. Where will those families get the help they need? Even though the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968 to prohibit discrimination in the financing, sale, and rental of homes, as you can see, racial disparities in housing still exist today. In 2018, the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana conducted an audit that revealed what they called significant levels of discrimination against African Americans. Their study showed qualified African-American applicants in predominantly white areas of Marion County experienced discrimination an astounding 76% of the time. The center had conducted the same audit in 2013 and the results were very similar, proving little, if any, progress has been made. Can you imagine being a fully qualified applicant trying to get a home and still being told no 
while at the same same time your white peers are told yes? How frustrating. So tonight we're lucky to have four guests from our community to talk with us about these issues. Joining us tonight are subject matter experts in housing and the history of systemic racism of housing in Indianapolis. Their bios are so extensive that I couldn't do them justice in the short time we have here tonight. However, their bios will be available on our blog for you to read through, so please do that at your leisure. So tonight, please welcome Robert Hawthorne, Executive Director of the Westside Community Development Corporation, Brianka Merritt, Clinical Assistant Professor and the Founding Director of the Center for Research and Social Policy at the IU Public Policy Institute, Vop Osili, Current President of the Indianapolis City County Council, and Wildstyle Pachelle, who is an Indianapolis community member and advocate. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you. So let's get started with our questions um, that we have for our panelists. Our first question, um, for decades, many banks and other mortgage, a US Census Bureau survey revealed that 24% of adults in Indiana reported that they had missed their previous housing payment or had little confidence that they would make their next one on time. Imagine not knowing if you will have a roof over your head a month from now. Indiana's eviction moratorium ended on August 14th, and according to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, more than 250,000 low income Hoosier renters affected by COVID-19 will need rent relief before September 2020. Where will those families get the help they need? Even though the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968 to prohibit discrimination in the financing, sale, and rental of homes, as you can see, racial disparities in housing still exist today. In 2018, the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana conducted an audit that revealed what they called significant levels of discrimination against African Americans. Their study showed qualified African American applicants in predominantly white areas of Marion County experienced discrimination an astounding 76% of the time. The center had conducted the same audit in 2013 and the results were very similar, proving little, if any, progress has been made. Can you imagine being a fully qualified applicant trying to get a home and still being told no, while at the same, same time your white peers are told yes. How frustrating. So tonight we're lucky to have four guests from our community to talk with us about these issues. Joining us tonight are subject matter experts in housing and the history of systemic racism of housing in Indianapolis. Their bios are so extensive that I couldn't do them justice in the short time we have here tonight. However, their bios will be available on our blog for you to read through, so please do that at your leisure. So tonight, please welcome Robert Hawthorne, Executive Director of the Westside Community Development Corporation, Brianka Merritt, Clinical Assistant Professor and the Founding Director of the Center for Research and Social Policy at the IU Public Policy Institute, Vop Osili, current president of the Indianapolis City County Council, and Wildstyle Pachelle, who is an Indianapolis community member and advocate. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you. So let's get started with our questions um, that we have for our panelists. Our first question, um, for decades, many banks and other mortgage lenders in the US denied mortgages to people, mostly people of color in urban areas, preventing them from buying a home in certain neighborhoods or even getting a loan to renovate their house. This practice known as redlining started in the 1930s and was backed by the US government. As a result, 
This has led to Black families having 52% less home equity over the last 40 years because their home was redlined. We want to know tonight, does redlining still exist today? And are people of color still more likely to be turned down for a mortgage in Indianapolis than their white counterparts? Robert, let's start with you. Okay. Uh, well, I, I will start by saying, although redlining has been officially illegal for over 50 years, the systemic influence of redlining still continues to uh, persist. Um, that action of redlining, of, of talking about the infiltration of Negroes into a particular geographic area, bringing down the value, started back in 1932. And I believe what that did was it, all, it, it institutionalized racism in that area economically by allowing, by helping people understand that the value of their property was directly influenced by how many black people lived in their neighborhood. So just one black person in the neighborhood brought down the value. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at those maps today and we look at what's going on in our community today, we can see that three out of the four neighborhoods in um, that was on that map back in 1930-32 are still um, neighborhoods that are struggling economically today. Thank you so much. Priyanka, would you like to weigh in on this question? Sure, um, I'd just like to piggyback on what Robert said in terms of the ongoing nature of the effects of redlining that, you know, it's not just about looking at areas that are neighborhoods with homes that have poverty, but that we're still seeing concentrations of black folks living together. And I really wanna highlight that, you know, sometimes anecdotally we can conflate race and class and that being black means you're low income, but these are also folks who live in these neighborhoods who are long-term homeowners who might be, you know, professionals, white collar employees as well, folks who have owned their home for 30 plus years who are also living in a neighborhood that also because of redlining doesn't have the same types of amenities, access to stores, um, and a variety of other things that we can attribute to disinvestment in those neighborhoods because there's not an incentive for businesses and other organizations to be located there as well in addition to housing. Very true. Bob, did you wanna weigh in on this one? Sure. Uh, I do appreciate what Robert and Brianka have both said. There are a number of other offshoots that go alongside of this. Um, these last, I don't know, 80, 90 years of official redlining. Um, the lack of wealth in a household and the impacts of that lack of wealth on one's credit um, plays a significant role in one's uh, perceived credit worthiness. These are ripple effects that we will continue to see um, probably for another generation or so. Um, so yes, redlining uh, was like a cancer that has not gone away. And it still continues to impact families, um, you know, generations after its inception. Absolutely. I can think of a number of younger people who, you know, owning a home doesn't even register for them as something that they should be aspiring towards. It's, it's a foreign concept. So absolutely. Um, Wild Style, do you have anything to add here? Yeah, I would uh, definitely agree with all the uh, other panelists and I'd like to, to really take that a step forward from redlining to really um, economic apartheid because uh, it's, it doesn't just start with uh, uh, black people applying for loans and being turned down. Oftentimes you can't even get an email back from a bank uh, uh, to even know how to apply. Um, in 2018, the Brookings Institute released a study showing that um, the devaluation of assets in black neighborhoods, that 40, that, that um, on average, uh, homes in black neighborhoods were undervalued by 48,000. And banks just don't, for financial reasons beyond just, uh, that are based on race and class, but for financial reasons, Banks don't want to loan money in black neighborhoods because the homes are appreciated so much lower. Um, to give you a good example, 
I'll talk about the house I'm in right now. I own it uh, free and clear. I did not go through a bank. Um, I bought it on a land contract. And the land contract was only $23,000 in 2013. And no bank would have responded to an email or been serious about trying to give me a loan for, for $23,000. But yet, I moved into this house. It was moving condition, and we just needed to fix uh, some minor plumbing leaks for, you know, for me to live here. So, you know, the years of redlining... Um, have created a, a whole different situation um, where it's just become economic apartheid for uh, many Black families. Thank you all so much. Um, let's talk about the reverse of, of this, reverse redlining. Um, it's a term used to describe the targeting by predatory mortgage lenders of minority communities for unusually expensive or exploitative loans, um, more commonly called subprime loans. We saw a lot of that in the financial crisis of 2008. Um, so I'd like to hear from you all, how did reverse redlining impact the African-American community specifically in the financial crisis of 2008? Brianka, what do you think about that? Yeah, so I think that, I mean, it was pretty devastating. You, everyone has already talked about how difficult it's been, you know, using Wild Sal's term of, you know, economic apartheid. I mean, that's exactly what it's been for decades. So, you know, especially after the late 90s, the economy was rolling around pretty, pretty smoothly and Black folks in particular were able to be able to afford homes at a greater rate than they had and, you know, some of that, especially toward the mid to late 2000s, turned into, as you said, kind of more predatory lending practices. And so uh, what we saw was tons of financial devastation that studies tell us Black folks have still not recovered from. Uh, you alluded to, you know, it also has affected the Hispanic or Latino community as well. Uh, but certainly the Black community felt that pretty devastatingly. And again, thinking about um, Black folks being more likely to live in the same neighborhood, we saw that you know, if you're someone who's able to afford a home, even in the wealthiest Black communities in the country, that uh, having predatory lending completely devastated a lot of folks' ability to own homes because they were purchasing homes um, at a rate and at a price point that they were technically eligible for, but because of the details of how that loan worked out, they got caught once the market crashed. And so again, it disproportionately affected Black homeowners, and we're still seeing over a decade later, people who have not been able to recover financially uh, both in home ownership and in just general assets from uh, that period in time. Unfortunately, sounds like a lot of shattered dreams, possibly. I mean, especially if this was the first time that a lot of people were having success in buying homes, um, just to have all of that blow up in such a devastating way is it's heartbreaking. Um, Robert, do you want to add to that? Oh, sorry, just a second, we can't hear you. There we go. Here we go, okay. I, th I think she's right on target with what she said. Um, even when I was working in the Martindale Brightwood neighborhood and trying to assist people in getting loans, um, a lot of them already had loans, but their loans were at an astronomical interest rates, uh, which um, I believe was very predatory in nature. When I calculated it out, a lot of the interest rates was running about 50% um, just to try to hold, hold their family together. And if you look at the money they were spending, had they been able to get a regular loan from a bank um, or even from a family member for that matter, um, they would increase their ability to, to cover their own bills and things like that much, much better. So, you know, those who, um, those who have taken on those subprime loans in 2008 you know, I think the statistics show there was eight times more likely to, to go into default and to um, lose their homes. Um, so that, that in itself really devalued um, Black America's wealth. It took away all that progress that was made in all those previous years and basically started generations over. And um, like you have said, for generations, a lot of Black families have not been able to recover. 
Thank you. Wild Style, would you like to weigh in on this one? Yeah, I, I would like to talk about the, um, you know, the, the effects were, were really devastating. And I think, you know, something that, that a lot of people didn't understand was there were uh, things called uh, balloon mortgages. Uh, particularly uh, when I first attempted to buy a house in 2003, there were homes being built out on the Far East Side that uh, you could qualify for very little down and you would get a balloon mortgage. But the balloon mortgage meant or it was that you were only paying on the uh, interest and not the principal. So in 15 years, then you would have to refinance the, the house and actually start paying off the loan without ever having touched it. And, and um, I don't know how those are even legal, but that was that was one of the things that was going on, uh, particularly in this neighborhood uh, uh, on the northwest side. It's an older neighborhood. And my next door neighbor talked about uh, inheriting the house uh, from her parents. She had to take care of them before they passed away. And they had uh, uh, refinance the house to do some repairs on it and she had paid it off but the uh, the company still threatened to foreclose and she had to get a lawyer to fight them because she wouldn't keep paying them after she had paid paid off the loan so that that was a, a big mess and there was a lot of just legit cases of out and out fraud and people uh, foreclosing on homes that they had no right to foreclose on Wow. I think a common theme that we're seeing here, too, is that, you know, people not having had um, a history of home ownership in their families may not know. They don't know the ins and outs of mortgages and financing and what to look for, and they get preyed upon. And unfortunately, you know, something like a balloon mortgage or a subprime mortgage might sound like a good idea. And you know, they're not fully educated on what the consequences of those things may be. Um, so unfortunately, all of those things, like you all said, are, are such a ripple effect. Um, so let's talk about some more local examples um, of some of these things. Let's talk about Indiana Avenue. Um, hopefully, most of you all that are tuned in tonight are familiar with Indiana Avenue. Um, in its heyday, it was known as the Black Wall Street or Indianapolis's Harlem. Uh, it was a mile of businesses that catered to Black residents and surrounded by some 400 to 500 acres of Black neighborhoods. Um, the Madam Walker building is down there. Um, the Walker Legacy Center is still there today. But um, it's certainly not what it was in its heyday. So can you discuss what Indiana Avenue once was and how it existed and what or who really brought about change in that area and, and what's caused it to not be the Black Wall Street um, today that it was at one time? Um, Wild Style, I know you've done some work in this area. I'd uh, love to have you weigh in on this. Yeah, thank you. Um, earlier this year, I wrote an article called uh, Indiana Avenue, the uh, Ethnic Cleansing of Black Indianapolis. And it, it talks about a lot of these points, um, that Indiana Avenue was, was one section of it. Uh, what is now Martin Luther King was the other street. And honestly, given the heritage, either one of the, those streets could have been named Martin Luther King, because originally uh, Martin Luther King was West Street and Northwestern. Um, but there were four to 500 acres of, of black neighborhoods. It wasn't just um, a strip along what is the uh, Indiana Avenue. And something that I didn't realize until a couple of years ago was that the Walker Theater was almost smack dab in the middle of all these neighborhoods, uh, rather than being at the start of it or at the end of, of a strip. Um, uh, when I did my research for the article, I found out that there were black firefighters and black policemen patrolling the area around the, uh, the canal and close to the Walker by 1873. Um, the, the area that, that is ransom 
place over by uh, 10th and, and Martin Luther King and, and a lot of the areas over there, it never actually been inhabited before, even by the Native Americans, since a lot of it was swampland. So um, Indiana Avenue, it being uh, the Harlem of Indiana, it wasn't a result of white flight and, and blacks inheriting all these buildings and homes that uh, uh, from its outset, a lot of those buildings and a lot of those homes uh, were built for black people or uh, uh, by black people uh, for commerce and, and for, for black culture at the time. Uh, one of the things that happened uh, due to redlining and, and basically economic apartheid was that nobody was able to uh, to do a lot, uh, uh, get access to, to money for repairs. It just wasn't that easy. Um, this helped make uh, numbers, got, uh, people, illegal gambling, and, and other people that, that, that earn their money illegal. It, it made them the banks uh, and, uh, and, and really the heroes of the community. So there was always tight for uh, cash. And during the jazz era, um, they had a lot more uh, uh, white patronage of the clubs um, until the police chief cracked down on that, and that caused things to get even worse. And so by the 50s, when um, IU was planning this giant commuter campus in the area, uh, things were a bit economically depressed. And, and IU, um, before, I think uh, IUPUI was officially founded in either 1969 or 1970, but IU had been working on this since the 1950s. And even the hospital, uh, IU Health Hospital, it had started taking land all the way back uh, in the, in the um, I believe, the 20s or 30s, and then again in the 50s. And during this time, the black population was exploding in Indianapolis at the same time as IUPUI was needing more land, and the city was not necessarily uh, uh, wanting to keep everybody down that close to to their central business district that was actually struggling at the time. So uh, combine that with the highways that were coming through. Uh, at one point, I think I-70 was slated to go up West Street instead of around, so the Walker Theater staff was preparing for the building to actually be torn down at one point. Point. And then they diverted it, but still put the highway through the northern part closer to Martin Luther King. So all of this, um, in, in, in essence, wiped out uh, uh, most of the neighborhoods, uh, caused the economy to, to completely collapse um, over there. And it was, I think it was much more, it was very destructive to black culture, but people don't understand that. Um, there was a higher degree of home ownership over there, and we know that black homes don't uh, don't don't appreciate it the same rate as as white uh, 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 communities. But that was stability. The, there was a commercial district. There was a lot of black home ownership, and a lot of that was lost. So that when um, the city uh, condemned houses and gave them the IUPUI or the highway, uh, took the houses by eminent domain and gave them. A little bit of money. Um, the money did not allow homeowners to go build another house or go buy a house somewhere else. So most of them became renters. Uh, most of the businesses actually didn't relocate, uh, and, and a lot of people became employees. It's amazing to hear about our heritage in, in such a vibrant area. Um, but sad to, to see it have gone the way that it did, fortunately. Um, you all might be seeing on the screen, we are sharing some photos of Indiana Avenue and the area during its heyday. Um, so you can see it was a thriving community, lots of businesses and people in the area. Um, it, was, it was a beautiful thing. Um, and you all know the Madam Walker Theater, as uh, Wildstyle mentioned, is right in the middle of it. Um, I know it's commonly thought of as sort of the, the anchor point. Um, 
So it's interesting to learn wild style that it, it actually was in the center of that area. So that's good information. I feel like, can I say something if you don't mind? Absolutely. Uh, what comes to mind right now is this being a, a, a prime example of the, of the lack of regard for the African-American community, the black community. Um, in the same way that buildings were, were, were torn down, were removed, it's the same, I think the same level of ease by which the, the highway was, was, was drawn through and, and, and decimated uh, our communities, black communities. You know, I've got a mother, an elderly mother, um, class of 1940, by, by the way, from Christmas Addicts High School. Wow. Um, yeah, um, got longevity. Yeah. Um, and she would tell me stories about, obviously, their time at the Walker, the teapot. And she would also talk about uh, the, the, the Phyllis Wheatley y, you know, YWCA and how much that meant to their family. You know, my, my, my grandfather was a 33rd you know, degree Mason. You know, the lodge was there. Um, his brother-in-law, my, you know, my great uncle owned um, Hills Brothers um, uh, a movie theater. It was where they went for their own social, you know, for their own, for their own society where they got together, where black families got together. And as I said, this is a prime example of just the ease with which a culture um, has been shown such little regard that there was nothing cherished. And if we look back on, on, on the Phyllis Wheatley, you know, YW, I've seen photos of it, amazing building. You know, we, we love the, the Walker building. It's got amazing history, but we had another, a, a number of other buildings down there and a culture, and unfortunately, we have very little left. You know, so whatever we do right now is going to be a replica re versus sort of a rebirth of something, you know? And, and that, is, that is incredibly disturbing. Thank you so much, Bob. That, that is a absolutely important perspective um, because it does feel like we, are, we were very disregarded and you know, here it was a, a thriving area, a positive cultural and economic center in our city and was decimated. Um, so thank you all for sharing. Okay, let's um, talk a little bit about white flight. That's a term that uh, Wildstyle mentioned earlier. Um, White flight is a term referring to the migration of white families from cities that are becoming more diverse and um, their flight to the suburbs that are typically more homogenous. Um, usually that's to escape the influx of people of color coming into the area. How has white flight impacted our local communities in Indianapolis? And what assumptions or biases are held about population changes in our neighborhoods. Um, Brianka, let's hear from you. Sure, so, I mean, I would say at least for Indianapolis that um, a lot of white flight as we traditionally call it would really have been, I think, fed up quite a bit due to UNIGOV. A lot of folks, particularly black people, um, by the time the 60s rolled around, were really concentrated in the center parts of the city. Um, a lot of white folks um, had moved out and UNIGOV was a way to kind of recoup, you know, a lot of tax dollars for the entire county. So they were able to expand it. And now we have, of course, as Bob knows, the city county council, we have um, a broader way of governance um, and boundaries for the city. And we saw folks moving out. And a lot of that was also expedited by integration orders, federal integration orders for um, black and white kids to go to the same schools. And so in fear of that, uh, a lot of white families uh, moved outside of Center Township into the external townships as black folks moved further out into the townships, white folks moved out into uh, the Donut County suburbs. And so there's definitely a very close thing. I think we've alluded to it a little bit in terms of housing, land use, segregation, race, uh, but schools and living next to people who don't look like you has been really a lot of the driving force behind these efforts. And I wanna be really clear that when it came to UNIGOV, I didn't say this explicitly, but that schools, as you know, are the only things that really we don't have in unified government because when they're making those decisions and they know that their taxpayer base of white middle-class employees um, did not want to integrate schools. We have, we have you know, 11 different school districts officially in the city 
as a result of that initial decision uh, decades ago. And so, um, you know, if you want to look to where things are happening, schools are usually a great signal to see where parents and where white parents in particular are valuing um, things like race and diversity and culture, because historically, uh, when we see black families in a certain area, historically white folks have left. And as everyone has alluded to, that also helps expedite things like community disinvestment and other things from uh, government investors and other entities that can look at that as a signal to say, we're gonna follow where we think the money is and we think that is with white middle-class residents. So in short, white flight had a huge impact on how we perceive a lot of things in neighborhoods with a lot of black residents in our city. Very interesting how, you know, schools and school systems are an indicator of that. Um, thank you for bringing that point up because that's not something that we've really called out in, in our questions tonight, but is an important thing for us to know. Um, you also think about, you know, things like a Starbucks. Um, you know, our office is down at 30th and Meridian, and we've often talked about why there's no Starbucks in the area. You have to go all the way to 14th and Capitol um, or, you know, somewhere north. And just the the neighborhood and the influx of color in a neighborhood or just the perception in general can cause amenities to not be brought into those areas, even though the residents of those areas might be consumers that want or need those products and services. So um, all of these things play a part in, in this. Um, Robert, do you want to talk about this question some? And we'll need to get you unmuted. <laughs> both of y'all, both of y'all did such a great job on, <laughs> on answering that. Um, I, I guess when I when, when I look at, at white flight is really I look at it as a, as a disinvestment in the community. Uh, from my perspective, um, whenever uh, we have had white flight, whether it was in Philadelphia, where I grew up at, um, or even in Indianapolis, from what I've seen, is that we have a, a disinvestment in the neighborhood that goes along with it. And so um, it's perceived as an area that's no longer valuable, um, no longer worthy of, of uh, putting in streets, curbs, and sidewalks, and things of that nature um, from the city's perspective. But I think it's a very real thing because um, that flight actually exits a lot of the, your medium income um, dollars along with it. And with those dollars go to tax bases, and with the tax bases goes our ability to operate as a city. So, you know, th this kind of, of, of um, urban flight, the circular piece of urban flight, really is something I think we need to really look real closely at because it's, it's the one thing I think if we ever got under control that we could actually build a base in the community, a financial base for the, for the city that we could actually build something upon and, and affect all, all residents um, regardless of color or economic status. Thank you so much. Um, uh Akila, do you mind? Yes. I just want to say one other thing, and I'm glad that uh, um, Robert and Brianka were, were, were so clear on, uh, on their comments. What we do need, and I'm hoping this will come at the end as well when people make suggestions, we need a new funding formula. Let's just, I think your, your question right now was, how has this impacted local communities? Well, our schools are paid for by those taxes. Those taxes that diminished when wealthier individuals left, and unfortunately, our, our property values based on our, the public perception of what is value also plummeted. The impact was on our schools and on our children. Those children who are gonna become adults you know, in this next generation. So I, I just wanna say, I, I think it'll be important as we go forward and as more, there's more discussion and more normalizing discussion on race and equity on black and white and the history of racism, that we, that we start talking about a new funding formula for the state of Indiana so that we can get greater opportunities for our students, for our kids, um, you know, in black communities, in brown communities, those communities that historically um, have been disregarded. Very good point. Thank you, Vav. Um, and that's actually a good segue into our next question, which is about gentrification. Um, because again, all of these things 
are intersected. Um, gentrification is a term that's used to describe the economic and cultural transition that often occurs when wealthier residents start to move back into predominantly lower income urban neighborhoods. Um, according to a recent Savvy report, some of the most significant gentrification in Indy occurred in Fall Creek Place. Um, that gentrification led the neighborhood to become 3.8 times whiter and 2.5 times wealthier. So again, talking about that tax base, the median income. Um, the Mableton Fall Creek neighborhood has also become more than twice as white and twice as college educated as it was just 10 years ago. So talk to us about why gentrification matters um, and what specific role can community development policies play in addressing gentrification and displacement. Bob, let's, let's continue with you. So let's talk about gentrification. Um, gentrification, I think, on the, on the surface, on the face of it, is not a bad thing if you can afford to, to stay, if, if you can afford it. Um, the challenge is that so many of our longtime homeowners who have raised families, who have raised generations within a household and have come to expect and, and maybe sometimes cannot afford to pay more than a certain amount, for example, on their property taxes, when we have an influx of a new population, a wealthier population, and as, as we've seen when, when, when communities, the value of homes diminished when certain populations left, well, when those populations sometimes come back, those values then escalate again based on, 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 the, on the values that we in this country place on certain, on, on, on certain characteristics. So if my home value increases, so do my property taxes. And if I have become used to and am able to afford a certain level, and we've talked, in, and I think we've talked a lot already about household wealth, if I can no longer afford to stay there, then it is a bad thing. So I'll say this, for the last five uh, sessions of the General Assembly, the last five, the council and members of the community have gone to the state to ask for powers for our, our assessor, our treasurer, to be able to mitigate property taxes for those individuals who are longtime homeowners and who may be challenged you know, economically. What a horrible thing to have raised your family in a, in a community and finally to see value come back into your home, value come back into your family, and then not be able to enjoy it. There's an article I just read that um, the difference between white and black household wealth is as much as $212,000, and so much of that is based on the value of one's home. So my value could increase and, my, and I could pass something on to my children, but I've got to bail out early because I can't afford the taxes. There's a, there's a problem with that. And I think, I think going forward, here's another question that I hope we will be able to get our, some of our, our, our listeners and our watchers this evening. If you want to do something about it, then it's something that we have to get from the state house. The state house governs how we regulate our property taxes. We don't do this locally. If we had been able to do it locally, we would have handled it. And we would not be talking today about this overwhelming fear of gentrification. So, I mean, it is, a, it is a really passionate topic for me and for a number of households in our community. Uh, and we have to do something to protect our, long, our longtime homeowners. They must enjoy their own wealth. They must. I certainly appreciate your passion around that, Bob. And I'm glad that you mentioned action items because we are going to get to that at the end of tonight and, and give our viewers some tangible solutions that they can um, work towards. So let's definitely keep that in mind when we get there. Um, I want to make sure that, that everyone hears you on that. Um, Wild Style, do you want to add something to this question? Sure. Um, from my perspective, I believe gentrification it's a loaded term. I don't know. Everybody had, there's no strict textbook definition of, of gentrification. 
but in my eyes, it's it's evil all the time. Um, when we're talking, when, when we just talked about how the redlining existed, it exists now. The people, uh, um, the the black home home ownership is, is almost impossible for a lot of people. Uh, the ability to get the loans, that even if once they they get a home. Uh, it's probably undervalued by forty-eight thousand dollars in the first place. So, home ownership is not an option for many Black people. Uh, we're sitting at about thirty-nine percent um, Black home ownership uh, here now. It's not an option. So, when we're talking about gentrification and we only uh, are talking about um, long-time homeowners, honestly. Those are often the lucky or the even the more influent blacks that even got there. And I'm lucky uh, and, and uh, not the affluent. But when we talk about that, it has to we have to understand that. Um, housing should be a human right. And what's going on, like gentrification doesn't happen when house flippers buy a couple of houses and flip them because that's not enough to uh, change the neighborhood. All the gentrification that I've ever seen, and I've looked up a lot in, in Indianapolis history, has always started with public-private partnerships. And that starts not just at the State House, but it starts at City Hall with uh, uh, what, what development plan, how many of the uh, uh, lots did you give to a developer, what tax incentives, what TIF money, bonds, financing, what grants did you co-sign to get these developers to to be able to gentrify the neighborhood in the first place? And if we're not having that conversation that that there needs to be an investment in to poor black people to have housing stability as a human right, um, then I, I don't feel like, you know, there's nobody more culpable, but I, I would say that a lot of it starts at City Hall and, and, and local politicians are going to have to be serious about, uh, you know, understanding that the stuff that they're signing off uh, for in finance and all these different deals directly to bring and not because they chose. Thank you so much for adding to that. Um, Brianka, do you have anything you'd like to add to this question? Yeah, I think we're all saying the same thing, but I do want to reiterate the idea that Black folks in particular have been dependent on, I won't say dependent on, but at the whims of other people's decisions. And so I think while some made a good point, these gentrification type activities didn't happen just because of house flipping. It came because there were decades of disinvestment leading up to that. And so, you know, these are really specific things that, you know, I think a lot of times we get caught in this rhetoric of, you know, homeownership is possible if you just, you know, work hard, save, build up your credit score. But it's so much more complicated when you're doing all of those things and you're in a neighborhood that someone who's either disinvested in or, you know, as everyone else has said, you live in a place that's been pretty stable and now it's not. And so, and those are things that unlike other communities, we don't have as much of a say because if someone has deemed your neighborhood or the things around you to be less valuable to get that gentrification started way in advance, it makes it really difficult for um, other folks to just up and move. And I think we also, also made a good point about folks who have the means to be able to get a house, but also those changes in property values affect rent. So even if you are, you know, someone who can't afford a home, but you are renting an apartment or another property, if your tax values go up in the neighborhood and your landlord is feeling the effects of those tax increases, that's going to get bled over into your monthly rent or other costs as well. So even though, even if you're not a homeowner, you can still feel the effects of gentrification as well. And again, if we think about the fact that, again, Black renters and homeowners tend to live in the same neighborhood in Indianapolis, that has effects for people who are uh, not just relatively financially stable, but those who are already on the edge and could push them even further into other issues. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
I want to add on to this conversation um, zoning. So we've talked about you know, affordable housing in neighborhoods, but exclusionary zoning is a policy that keeps affordable housing out of neighborhoods um, through land use and building code requirements. It's a legal practice that has been used for decades to keep lower income people and disproportionately racial minorities out of wealthy and middle-class neighborhoods. Um, where did exclusionary zoning come from and what impact has it had on the black community? Um, Bob, can we hear from you on this? Sure. So towards the end of the 19th century, when you know, America started as an agrarian community, an agrarian society, um, and there was not much need to worry about who your neighbor was. But towards the end of the 19th century, when we had an influx of, of migrants, we had great urbanization, there was a, there was a rush to the cities. Um, there were people who were, um, who didn't wanna be around uh, people of color, um, black, white, brown, I mean, black, brown, whatever, Asian, um, immigrants from so, you know, Southern Europe, et cetera. Um, they created these policies basically that said, um, at first they were, they were based on race until that was deemed you know, illegal that you know, no blacks need apply, you know, you know, no, um, um, uh, you know, no Latinos, no, uh, nobody who didn't speak English or, or, or German, you know, need apply, that kind of thing. Um, but it, it took a different turn. It, it took a sort of interesting turn when it was no longer based on, on race, but it was based on factors that are impacted by race, such as you can't build here you can't build anything here that is under an acre or under two acres, or you can only build single family. Now, if I don't have wealth, and if I don't have wealth, that land, that large part of land is gonna cost me more. And the house that I build on that is going to cost me more and my family more than I would be paying if I were living in an apartment. I mean, the, it, 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 it's that simple. So this exclusionary zoning thing was, was used to exclude people who didn't have money. And so often the people who didn't have money were black, brown, and oftentimes you know, Mediterranean um, and Asians. So we, we try to move around that, I think. I think there's been a greater awareness, especially since the Fair Housing Act you know, in, in 68, um, but it still does exist. And I think the most advanced cities are the ones that are looking at um, prohibiting that kind of zoning where, where only one house can, 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 can sit on one or two acres, prohibiting that. And it was also a way for, for communities to say, we don't want multifamily housing. We don't want affordable housing. We want mansions. And the people who could afford mansions did not necessarily look like me. Sounds like... Um many shades of people being affected by this, but unfortunately just a way around the laws when the laws start making racism not so easy and blatantly um, legal, there are still ways to, to keep people out. So very unfortunate. Well, um, we've had some good conversation here. Um, speaking of systemic racism, Talk about how that has been institutionalized in current policies and laws um, at the federal, state, and local levels. Do you guys think these policies impact things like eviction rates and homelessness? Um, how has housing been impacted by eviction laws? And we talked earlier about the impending eviction um, flood that's coming through now that the moratorium has ended with people affected by COVID-19. Talk to us about how our laws are impacting this. Um, Wild Style, can you weigh in on this? Sure. Um, we are in a eviction apocalypse, uh, uh, I think. 
if there was. I think we're losing an article that was released on Friday until that. Article. Can you hear me? Okay. We lost you for a second. If you can repeat what you said. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, an article that came out last night, there were 400 evictions uh, just from Friday when the moratorium lifted un until the article was written. Things are, are, are not working uh, with affordable housing. Uh, for too long, we've invested in the landlords to become bigger landlords uh, for poor people while... Uh, you know, they raise the rents. They don't take care of the properties that much. And not only have we not invested in the people themselves, but even the government doesn't own the housing to where they can directly do anything about this. And so we've got a, a situation where the city sent up a city set up a, a rent assistance program and 40 percent of the landlords won't even fill out the paperwork to go collect the money because they think that they would rather just evict the people. And this isn't a new situation. Uh, when I was researching for my article about Indiana Avenue, I looked up a lot of information about Lockfield Gardens. It opened in 1937. Um, it was funded at the same time as the housing project in Atlanta. And it was one of the first housing projects in the United States of America, uh, right there on Indiana Avenue. Um, and when we think of a housing project now, we think of Section 8, but at that time, um, the rents that they were charging would be the equivalent of about $390 for a one-bedroom and $500 for a two-bedroom. So this was in today's dollars. But the Apartment Association at the time fought them on during construction. actually during planning, construction, so landlords benefit greatly from um, the policies and they've influenced the policies in their favor uh, to really fleece poor people and the government. Thank you for that perspective, Wild Style. I think, um, you know, that number 400, that's that's astounding. Uh, we will definitely make sure that article that you referenced is available as one of the resources that we send out to everybody after the event. Um, but it's just hard to imagine what all of these families are going to do and where they're going to go. Um, Brianka, do you want to add to this? Yeah, because you did bring up the idea of institutionalization of racism in policies. And I think it's really important when we talk about housing, again, um, and everyone's mentioned this so far that we can do racism today without it being really explicit. And so when we think about renting in particular, we also talked about, um, you know, Section 8 housing and vouchers. And even though you technically can't discriminate against someone who's Black, you can have something called source of income discrimination, which means that a landlord cannot rent to you because you're getting your funding from a federal voucher. Um, who's more likely to use a federal voucher is usually black and brown people. So that's a way to discriminate against a class of folks that are technically protected. Uh, we did some work with United Way a couple of years ago looking at criminal history and housing instability because when folks um, are no longer incarcerated and they're trying to find a place to stay, a landlord can also say, well, you know, I just want to keep my property safe and free from crime. So because you have a felony on your record, I don't want to rent to you either. You can go someplace else because you know in the name of safety. And so those are things that are definitely, other states might have some protections we don't. Um, even if Indianapolis wanted to develop more affordable housing through federal vouchers, we have state policies that say, you know, no municipality in Indiana can, you know, make it easy for people to get affordable housing. So, you know, there are lots of things that, you know, even if the city tried to do with the state can kind of preempt or block some of those decisions to, again, like make it harder for people who might be lower income. But again, because those folks are more likely to rent tend to be black and brown, they're more likely to feel the brunt of policies that even aren't explicitly racist in that way. And that's happening all the time today as we speak. That's not a historic policy. That's something that we're dealing with constantly today. Thank you. And I think it's something we should all strive to be more aware of, more educated about. Um, you know, Vop mentioned earlier, using our voices at the State House. Um, 
let's talk about some of those tangible solutions. So looking forward, what are some very tangible action items that United Way of Central Indiana and members of our community can champion to address the disparities in housing? Um, Robert, let's start with you. Well, let's see, if I was to, uh, if I wanted the audience to take anything away, um, I guess I would say that, you know, racial inequity has been with us for a long time. It will continue to be a part of our culture um, until we take purposeful action. And so we need to understand that racial inequity in housing is rooted in policy. And we, uh, and what we need to do is to focus on changing policy. Uh, we need to work on intentional solutions um, that remove the weight of burden off of people of color. But we can't do that if, if people of color aren't at the table. So we have to have people who are in the problem, who are dealing with it on a daily basis, because it makes a difference on how the problem is solved um, or, or how the problem is identified. You bring, an, you bring an accountant in to solve a problem, you bring an engineer in to solve a problem, or you bring a um, construction worker to solve a problem, you're gonna get three different answers. And so what we have to make sure of is that we have somebody at the table that understands what their problem is and how to move, how to move that forward. So I think that's the real thing. We need to, we need to get people engaged in this process, um, dealing with our city county councilmen and, and others to create um, programs that actually work for us. And then we need to listen to marginalized people and then we need to take action. Thank you. Um, Vop, what would you add to that? I would add, sorry, can you make, I would add um, that we still have to go back to the state house where, where, where the funding is. That through the, for example, the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority, um, which creates programs for housing and incentivizes developers. We don't, we, we don't have the money to do that. That's where the funding comes from. That's where the federal funding comes from. That between that, um, as, I, and then as I mentioned earlier on today, the funding formula for our schools, which comes out of the state house, the ability for us here locally to mitigate property taxes, we don't have the ability to do that here. I, I would say that when the, when the general se session opens, uh, general assembly opens in, in, in January, um, that there's a lot of discussion uh, that, that we should have. And I know that members of, of for example, I know the Black Caucus in, uh, in, in the General Assembly is working right now towards having a, a set of initiatives and programs that they want to get addressed. But the way that that does work um, is when people actually go down to the State House um, and make their voices heard. I mean, it's what we've got to do because we don't have the funding. But unless we do that, anything else is just complaining without action. And, and that doesn't get us anywhere. Absolutely. We've got to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. Wild Style, what are your thoughts? I think um, from, I, I definitely agree with a, uh, a lot of what's been said. Uh, we're going to have to talk to low income black residents about about the real barriers and try to practice empathy. Um, in this city right now, if I'm hungry, there's a dozen different food pantries and a dozen different places where I can get something to eat, a hot meal given away. But if I weren't able to pay my rent, I can't even call a, a, a nonprofit to, to help me go get my stuff off the curb. And, and a lot of this drives uh, violence and fear and misery. And all the nonprofits, the state legislators, the local politicians all have to be on the same page um, that this is a public safety issue, uh, that housing is a human right. And that the city, whether whether you're already rich, whether you're middle class, or whether you're poor, the city will be better if we treat everybody uh, uh, like they deserve uh, a place to, to be able to lay their head. Very good point. I mean, we didn't even talk about 
the whole aspect of what people are oftentimes forced to do when they're in a, a survival mode or a situation where you don't know where you're going to lay your head that night or your kids or, um, you know, so from an aspect of public safety, from an aspect of just educating our black and brown neighbors on um, resources that are available to them, even just being empathetic and those are all important things that we all need to take on. So, Brianka, what are your thoughts? Oh, I would say in terms of if people are trying to figure out where they fit in this, again, housing is the biggest expense that most people have. My mom works in social services. She had a client yesterday who is paying $850 a month for an apartment complex that my parents lived in in the 70s when they were young and broke. And that's ridiculous because the apartment is terrible. And I don't think folks who have a really consistent income understand, kind of like Walsh said, what it means when you're in that situation, you're really, there's no outlet for you. And so I think in terms of what people can do, recognizing that housing is a big expense, but there are so many other ways that you can play a role. Housing intersects with employment and intersects with food access and intersects with public safety and criminal history. Uh, there are so many places where if you were in any area um, of work, it probably touches on housing in some, in some way. So I think building on what other folks have said, really working and engaging residents, black residents, low income residents, who are experiencing this day-to-day -to, -day to understand how what you do intersects with what they're experiencing so that you can help alleviate maybe something that's not housing related, but one of those other areas that could even play a big role in how they're experiencing um, their livelihoods as well. Thank you so much. Um, so we are gonna compile all of these responses and include these with the resources that we're sending out to all of our viewers tonight. Um, We'll also have some further resources to continue educating yourselves about these issues, um, reading that you can do, conversations that you can engage in. We just want to make sure that everyone is left with a few solutions that they can ponder. Um, so that being said, I'd like to thank our panelists once again, as well as thanking all of our attendees uh, for joining us today for this very important conversation. Um, it's our hope that each one of you have learned something new today and now have answers or have at least pondered the three questions that we had on the screen at the beginning of our time together tonight. Please know that, again, you will receive an email from United Way uh, with a recording of tonight's panel, additional resources, um, as well as a link to register for the next presentation in our series. Uh, we did also receive some audience questions um, from people who registered. And so we will attempt to answer those questions as well and include those in the resources that we're sending out. Um, you'll also get a link to register for the next Understanding the Roots of Racism series. Um, next month on September 16th, we will tackle food and hunger. So definitely will be an interesting topic to cover. Um, so in summary, some of the things I heard from our panelists tonight, things that you can do, just take purposeful action. Um, think about policies that need to be changed and how you can lend your voice to that. Um, talk to your state representatives, um, show up to vote, all of those things. Um, be empathetic to your neighbors and help bring resources to them that they may not be aware of, help educate them. Um, and again, advocate. Advocate at the state house, advocate federally, advocate locally. Um, that's so important because these policies are set by those lawmakers and we're the ones that put, put them in office. So, all right. Thank you so much for joining us.